thank you. Um, so I, I wanted to start with, uh, with the land acknowledgement, but I learned actually that Georgetown does not officially have one yet. Uh, and so I, um, you know, I reached out about that and um, the message I got back was that uh, they are actively working on it and um, that they wanna make sure that they do it properly. Uh, but in lieu of that, um, I think, I do feel like, uh, you know, the indigenous community has been so supportive of RSD12 and their work was, uh, was so wonderful. And I really just enjoyed having them uh, be a part of this so much that it, it really felt inappropriate not to say something. And so um, I've come up with my own land acknowledgement um, and hopefully that will suffice for now. Um, so to the best of my knowledge, Georgetown sits on um, the lands of the Piscataway and Nakatuchunk people. Um, and they have been here for generations. And I wanna pay respect to them uh, and to their elders, um, both past and present, uh, and recognize all the indigenous people's contributions to um, our society. Um, I also wanna acknowledge the, the painful history of dispossession and forced removal um, that have brought us all here. And uh, just state my own personal commitment to um, learning and working together again in the future. So thank you. Okay, so as we move forward, uh, welcome to RSD12 Washington, um, the party hub as the case may be. Um, so I am hoping that this will be a, a fun experience for everyone. Um, we've got a lot of activities planned and um, hopefully you won't feel overscheduled. There'll be plenty of time to interact. That's really what this is all about, trying to get people connected together. Um, and so uh, I also just want to start a little bit with um, some thanks right now. If I can, there we go. Okay, so people to thank, um, far, far too many of them. Um, many of them in this room, many of them online, um, many of them uh, other places, right? Um, first, the mastermind, Cheryl. Um, in fact, Come, come up here, Cheryl, come up here. You're not getting away. So many of you probably uh, may have realized this at some point that um, like Swatch is the unofficial sponsor of this conference. Um, I've like, so I've obviously the design has been inspired by um, the Memphis Blana movement, which I'll talk more about in a minute. Um, and so I wanted to give Cheryl this vintage Swatch watch um, to thank her for all of the time that she has put into the SDA and to RSD, uh, as well as to all the time that we've spent together. Um, it is still ticking um, as both of us are right now, um, barely, but still ticking nonetheless. And so um, I just wanted to give this to her with a big hug. I love Swatch watches. Uh, who doesn't love Swatch watches? Um, okay, so other people to thank right now. Um, Ella over there, uh, she is running the console right now, uh, but she's run a million other things as well. Um, could not have done this without her. She's really been um, an incredibly supportive person and uh, got far more than she signed up for when she agreed to be our lab manager uh, many months ago. So um, thank you so much, Ella, of course. Um, and Ryan Murphy, who um, ran all of the workshops uh, for the past two weeks, um, I've been to so many sessions and uh, I could tell you like Zoom fatigue is a real thing. Um, Ryan must also have it as well. Uh, and so I'm not sure he's out there right now, maybe he is, but I would definitely like to thank him uh, for all of his support and commitment as well. Um, yeah. And then, uh, my good buddy, J.R. Osborne, who is online right now, who's been here troubleshooting with us, who's uh, going to be helping us with our workshop later. Um, he has also been an incredibly supportive force. And so uh, we can also give him, there he is. Oh, look, he pokes his head in. Um, he does this sort of like, especially with those glasses on, he does this sort of like, where's Waldo kind of thing where he like hides in different places. Uh, okay, 
Um, a few other people, God, all the authors, all the reviewers, all of the speakers, the moderators, the volunteers, it's just been a real effort by everyone in this community. And um, I do think that everyone actually just needs to just give themselves a pat on the back because um, it's really been an incredible journey that we've all taken together. Um, and so thank you all for your participation. Really appreciate that. You can give yourselves a round of applause, it's fine. It's not selfish or narcissistic or anything like that. Um, and then finally, a word from our sponsors, right? So, um, you know, my department, the SDA, uh, Georgetown itself, uh, the National Science Foundation kicked in a little something. So um, all those people, thank you for your support and your continued support. Um, really appreciate that. Okay, so let's move on. The last people to thank, the hub hosts and organizers. So um, you saw us struggling up here just now. Uh, I know what it takes to put an event like this together. And everybody did something so different and so unique. And everyone was really sort of committed throughout the entire process. Um, and I, I am incredibly grateful for that. Um, I've really sort of come to think of each hub as its own sort of unique subculture within our ecosystem. And that has been like a really fascinating experience for me. Like every single hub did something different that was like uniquely them. And uh, that to me was just an amazing thing to bring all that together. And so thank you guys for all of your hard work. Um, it's, it's really appreciated. It is absolutely noticed and um, hope maybe we can do it all again one day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so second thing I need to do today is uh, to tell everybody where the bathrooms are. So we are here at that green circle. Bathrooms are over by that star. You'd think that you can just walk right through these doors to get there, but actually you can't. It's a trick. So you do have to go kind of all the way around and then uh, up there and then bingo, you've got it. Okay. <laughs> all right, so now to the meaty stuff. Let me see how much time we've got left. Start with this. Okay, we got a little time. So, like I said, I've been, uh, I've, been I've attended probably 90% of the sessions that we've had, and I've read like pretty much every single submission that's come through uh, over the past months. And that, that means that I've noticed a lot of things about this community and where it's going and what it's doing. And um, I wanted to just tell you some of the things that I've seen. I just wanted to reflect a minute on um, the work that I've seen come through and some of the discussions that we've had in all the sessions uh, to give you guys a little bit of an idea about where I feel like this community and systemic design is moving right now. So I've been calling this emerging trajectories. Trajectories is an idea that I just totally love. Um, it comes from systems and it appears in so many different places. And it, um, I think, just really speaks to a lot of the ways that we've connected together and are sort of moving in common directions, maybe splitting in different directions and then reinforcing each other. It's just a really good metaphor for how we've all been moving together. Um, and so I can honestly say for sure that we are on a growth trajectory right now. So I threw out some statistics at the beginning of the opening uh, many weeks ago, or at least two weeks ago, um, you know, all the numbers of papers and the number of submissions and things like that. Uh, and all of that data, I think it says, it says something for sure, right? Um, but actually the thing that has really sort of made me recognize uh, the, the growth that's been happening here has just been like some of the personal conversations and places where I've seen people talking about systemic design. So a couple of months ago, I was at a conference at the National Science Foundation, and there were a number of people in there who were talking about systemic design. And they were talking about it in, in ways that made me feel like they had been studying it and thinking about it. And um, I had never seen their work come through RSD, uh, but they were clearly aware and starting to incorporate that into their thinking. And that to me was like a huge, a huge sort of moment when, um, when I realized that like this had really grown far beyond our community. Um, and I think that's something to really recognize uh, and, to, and, to think, and to think very carefully about. Um, we're having a real impact out there in the world. Um, and, that's, and that's sort of what we've always wanted, right? Um, I also got a random uh, email from someone from my PhD uh, cohort who's in the same lab with me. My PhD is actually like virtual reality. And so um, it, was, it was unusual for them to, to reach out and say, hey, I've heard about this conference you're organizing. 
it's really in line with the kinds of things that I've been thinking about and trying to do. Um, and so, you know, they've been online and, um, and, and participating. And that to me is also making inroads into a very different community that I never really thought was going to be associated with RST. And so those, I think to me, those two anecdotes feel like they really back up all of that data, right? Like we really are moving out there and having an impact and the trajectory is still sort of moving forward into the future. And so that to me is an amazing success. Um, and again, like we're all a part of that success. And so I think we can keep that going for some time now. Um, I will also say though, that there is uh, something of a dark side to that success. And I think um, that's what I'm hoping that we can sort of work on together in the time that we've got here. So obviously um, when you've got so many different people, so many different subcultures, all thinking about and working around this thing that we're calling systemic design, there needs to be some negotiation about what that thing actually means, what is, what is part of it, what is not part of it. And I feel like what's happened here is we have at the very least, you know, if we've got 12 hubs, 12 very slightly, in some cases, uh, very different, in some cases, slightly different ideas about what systemic design is. And that's great. That plurality is incredibly important, right? Because that's where you sort of create the conversation and that's where real growth can happen. And that's where things can really start to solidify. And so I'm hoping that we can spend some time over these two days talking about what that means to us, right? And where we feel like we wanna move with our own work and where other people can connect to that work and we can support each other to keep us on a larger, more steady growth trajectory. Okay, so as I've sat through these sessions, I've reflected on the discussions that have happened and the things that I've seen. And I've been able to boil that down to three questions that I feel like are really primary. These are not like particularly um, gonna be particularly exciting questions, but they are, I think, really fundamental ones. I'm sure you all have some as well, right? And I will say that I do not have answers to those questions. I have not even come close to answering those questions. Um, but I do have some clues based on what's emerged from those discussions about what people think is important right now. And I wanted to just tell you those, just sort of like reverberate those things back to you so that we can all think about them together in our time here. So the first, and I think really the most fundamental question um, is what does RSD stand for? And I don't mean this in a philosophical way, like as in truth and justice and freedom. I mean, literally, what do these letters stand for? Because I'm an old timer, right? And I know that RSD stands for Relating Systems Thinking and Design. Um, but there's actually a bunch of people who have said that they thought it was research and systemic design, which is actually a very, really interesting sort of backronym that um, is something we may wanna talk about adopting. Um, and it also made me think, wow, if we're talking about systems thinking, where's the T in that acronym? Um, it's not there. And then I realized it's because saying like RSTD sounds like a terrible thing to say. Like, can you, can you join us for our STD? It's the 12th one we've had. It's like a terrible thing to say to someone. Um, and so I, I realized it's probably best that we were using RSD, but I, I really do want us to consider whether or not we feel like the connection between systems thinking and design is fundamentally what this is about or if there's a larger umbrella here that we just call systemic design that has a lot of other attributes to it, right? So there's some things about the systems thinking part of it that um, may, that, that I feel like there's lots of room for growth and lots of different kinds of work. So for example, thinking about the design of anything as a systemic process with multiple actors and an outcome, like that's a very systems oriented view of design. There's also this idea of design for systemic change, with this, which this community has really adopted over the past few years. And that's, an, that's a very different collection of things, a very different collection of problems that we would be facing and thinking and working on. And I would like all of those things to fit under this umbrella. And I think that we can do that. Um, I just also want us to think about where we position ourselves in relation to some other disciplines, right? And so that is my second question here. So how do we define ourselves in relation to other disciplines? And 
I've heard a lot of people bringing in lots of different disciplines over the past couple of weeks. So obviously like engineering, psychology was part of it. Um, we all care very deeply about environment. And so all of those things were also a part of this. And to me, that is, is, is a huge place where we can start thinking really deeply and very specifically about where this community plugs into a whole bunch of other people. There's a way to expand this network around different ideas on design and different ideas on systems that I think will help us all grow and find some real depth and real connection to each other and other and other places. So this is just a word cloud that um, with some of the words that I heard, different areas of design and, and different areas of systems where people were talking about them. People were using theories and methods from these places. And they all seemed like they were coming together in this community. And that uh, is really important, needs to be recognized, and I think nurtured. And so while we are moving forward, I think we need to think about and learn more about other disciplines and how they uh, integrate into our own work. Um, I've So I've made no mistake about it, right? So thinking about the way that a design discipline like interior design might actually be relevant for our community, right? This is not necessarily about systemic change, but it is in some ways about the way that design operates as a discipline systemically. And in the course of designing sort of the, the, the visual identity for this, for this conference, we had many discussions about where um, we had gotten ideas for visual identity in the past, right? And one of them was, Last year, we used mid-century modern as our approach. And so I was thinking, well, what comes after that, right? And what comes after that sort of historically is the Memphis Milano movement. And as I started to dig more deeply into this movement, I began to see so many interesting elements of systems thinking in the work that they were doing. So uh, this is the Carlton bookcase. Um, these are these are very polarizing designs. Like I, you know, I have such a love hate relationship with this uh, with this movement at this point. Um, but it is like it's very interesting, and there's something that's really specific about it that I think is actually is worth discussing right now. So I, you can just look at this for a second. Like it's got some interesting symmetry and balance to it. Um, it feels very dynamic and active to me, at least. Um, Here's some other bookcases that, um, you know, they, they use color, they use plastic, um, which was a real break from what mid-century was about. Um, here are some really interesting chairs that just use a lot of geometric form. Um, they come together very uniquely. They're very playful. Um, like this is another sort of classic example, right? What happens if you just remove a chair leg and replace it with a sphere, right? That's a really playful approach to design. Um, but out of, out of all of those things, the thing that I feel like really like sort of speaks to me about the systems thinking involved in this movement is this example right here. So it has many of those same elements, sort of the, the color, the blockiness. Um, it also, if you notice, has um, right at the foot of this bathtub, there's a lamp and it's sort of teetering on the edge into uh, the water. Um, and actually, if you look extra closely, uh, what you see is the plug is actually mounted on the surface of the tile, um, let alone the fact that the tile itself looks like it's covered in germs, like giant blue germs. Um, but like, this is, this is a really precarious thing, right? It's, it's at a tipping point right now, a very literal tipping point. Um, and it's, it, I mean, it's, it's suicidal, right? Like, they they knew they were not going to be around for very long, um, and the, and the movement itself only lasted about eight years, but it had worldwide impact. And I think to me, what what this speaks about about this sort of approach to design is that they knew that they were transitional, right? They knew that what came before had been around for many decades, and that it was very stable. And what they tried to do with their work was to think about the way that they were breaking from that tradition, and that they could try to seed something that was new, right? Try to seed the next generation of design. Um, and I think that's just a really important lesson. And I think it's really, it's a really interesting intersection of systems and design. That's not something we typically talk about here, right? Like it's not about systems change, um, but it is historical and it is systemic thinking. And so there's lots of places I feel like where systems and design integrate 
that really should be explored much more, much more deeply, much more systematically, um, and in fact, like much more playfully as well. Um, the third thing that I will, oh yeah, yeah, it's gonna fly in there. Um, third thing that I wanna mention is uh, the role of the designer, right? And I've seen designers play a lot of different roles in the work that's been presented here. Sometimes they are experts who are called on by clients to do expert work. Sometimes they are activists who meet with a community and try to surface those needs to people who have power and can make change. Um, sometimes they, uh, they, they are neither of those things, right? And they are actively trying to define their role in the process, both reflectively and, and effectively, right? And so I think we probably should spend some time thinking about how we, if we consider ourselves designers, we may not even consider ourselves to be all designers at this point, um, how we think about the role of the designer in this much larger ecosystem. Um, there's lots of different roles to play, and that has some really deep implications for how we train the next generation in systemic design. And so I did not want to offer all these questions uh, without giving some way of answering them. Um, like I said, I do not have answers. I've not been thinking about these things long enough to even suggest that I do. But there's a few things that I've heard over the past couple of weeks that I think hint at places where we might start looking, right? And those clues are, um, for one, in regard to, to this RSD question, which is sort of only half facetious, um, we had a lot of discussions over the past few weeks about language. Not even, to, not even in the sense that like we've got people in this community probably speaking 12 or 15 different languages at this point. Um, that's incredible. Uh, we had our first sort of Spanish language sessions as, as part of RSC 12, which is also a really interesting advancement. But just the way that we negotiate the everyday language, the terms that we use, those terms as boundary objects that we sometimes share, but may connote very different meanings to each other, there needs to be some more discussion about how we think about those things together and where we find overlap and maybe even defining some new language ourselves that is unique to this community so that we can identify and name things that, um, that other people have not seen or maybe things that people have seen but don't quite know what to call them. There's still a lot of room out there, I think, um, for, for, for us as a community to start identifying um, new concepts, new ideas, new practices that can move us into the future. The other thing, um, well, another thing that I think is a really interesting clue to where to find um, some insight into this other question of interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity is looking at other ways of knowing, right? And so um, I spoke a little bit about how much I really appreciated uh, the work of the Indigenous Knowledge and Wisdom Center. Um, I thought understanding their position and the way that they thought about uh, problems and situations um, was just so useful to me. And I think there's lots of different ways of knowing out there that this community is really uniquely positioned to embrace. So there's definitely analytical and scientific work that we should all be thinking about, right? Sort of uh, maybe thinking about things objectively and also questioning and reflecting on that, that objectivity. Um, there's also a real approach towards um, collecting methods from other disciplines and applying them in different ways and new ways. There's so much fertile ground here, I think, for, um, for how we can move forward in the future that I just, I think encompassing it all under this title of different ways of knowing and being accepting of those different ways of knowing and, and understanding them deeply is going to be a really productive way to go. And then third, and this is an interesting one for me at least, because um, I heard a lot about pragmatism, which I did not expect to hear. And it was very weird for me because a few weeks ago, I was saying to myself, I just think I need to be a little bit more pragmatic about some of the things I'm doing. And then to see that sort of echoed here to me was a real, it was a real sort of like interesting moment um, that made me sort of key in on this idea. Now, it's not without its problems, right? Because I think when you're thinking only pragmatically, you lose a lot of like the insight that comes with uh, sort of the deep work and the unpragmatic 
idea of research, right? Research itself is not pragmatic. Like Newton was not a pragmatist. Like if, if he did not question the way that the apple fell from the tree and just treated it as lunch, uh, he would not have discovered the laws of motion. And so I think there's, a, there's limits to what pragmatism can do, but there's also um, some real efficacy in it as well. And so I think understanding pragmatism and where it fits and where it doesn't uh, is a really important step for us to take. Okay, that's all I wanted to start with. I just wanted to see the ground right now. Um, later on today, uh, we're gonna do a workshop together where we will start to be able to sort of surface some of these different ideas to think about and talk about them together uh, and to hopefully come up with some shared meanings and shared understandings. Um, in the next few minutes, um, we have Abby Covert coming on. So um, please just take some time, uh, get some more coffee, get some breakfast. We're gonna get the tech sorted out so that we're set up for her talk. And then um, we'll be back here in about 20 or so minutes. Okay. All right, thanks guys, welcome.